Alrighty, looks like we are live. Welcome to uh, yet another paradigm shift in educational comedy. And the topic here today is a discussion about how people tend to misinterpret the things that come up in their lives filtered through a belief system that nothing good can ever happen to them. So then opportunity knocks and uh, they don't uh, know it for what it is. And I am really incredibly tired and drowsy right now, but um, felt like having this hangout anyway. So please excuse any verbal stumbles or inconsistencies of thought. Um, I guess the main reflection that I've been getting lately as pertains to this stuff is that... Um, like, in order to be the change that you want to create and starting to, you know, prove that things outside of other people's paradigms are possible, you know, there's one um, fear that tends to come up. And that is that, you know, people are going to look at your successes and then instead of uh, taking that as a signpost of oh, wow, look, something that's possible that I didn't thought was. Hey, maybe I want to have some fun and try that and see if it works for me. You know, they get all butthurt. Like, what the fuck? That, that person is having some success and I'm not. That just goes to show that everything everybody else does works and whatever I do never works and what the fuck? Wow, 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 wow. And, you know, people get all butthurt and shit, and they're not realizing that what they're actually being shown is, hey, look, here's something that might work for you. But they're so locked into this poor little me attitude of, like, you know, oh, nothing ever works, nothing can ever work, that's my belief system. So when these things get presented to them, they just see it as, oh, everything good always happens to everybody else, but not me. And um, one of the, I guess, one of the more recent um, reflections within that that has come up has been involving a service called uh, Patreon, where um, with, you know, obviously things like, you know, YouTube Partners Program and other ways to make money and stuff, that's all well and good, but... You know, you're still kind of subject to a bit of corporate Nazism, whereas Patreon allows, you know, your patrons to, like, subscribe to, like, you know, some sort of, like, a chosen, you know, monthly donation thing, and then, like, within different, you know, brackets of that, you know, there's, like, little thank yous and, and stuff that, you know, people get back, you know, with special, you know, product services whatever that you know then they can get as a result and um, one person that I've been well I'll just say a, a distance acquaintance of I mean it's not like I know her but her and I have talked a little here and there before she talks to a lot of people is a person by the name of Nixie Pixel um, Rich, is my screen share working properly? Yep. Okay, there it goes. Just wanted to make sure. Now, prior to her setting this up, because I want people to kind of understand both, both parts of the paradigm fence here, both sides. Prior to her setting this up, um, Nixie was kind of understanding, understandably getting a little emo, in her own words, because, like, her backstory is this, you know, she's just a girl who got into Linux, just a regular girl, and, you know, she thought, oh, cool, this Linux stuff, it's really cool, and as I learn about it, I, I can teach people about it and help people about it. This is going to be so cool. 
And then, like, she starts doing it, and, you know, she's getting all these, like, sexist comments and stuff, like, you know, oh, well, she's just asking to get raped, and, you know, oh, what is someone with boobs doing talking about tech, and, you know, all these really, like, nasty, hateful sorts of comments, and apparently General Tate Rich will be right back, as he just messaged me. But, you know, all these just hateful comments and stuff, and... You know, she was feeling really devastated and all that, but she decided to persevere and push forward anyway. And she kind of started getting herself a, a hell of a popularity rating on YouTube. But then, as the YouTube Nazism kind of kicked up more into into full force, and YouTube Partners Program, she had, she gotten so popular that that's literally the way she was making her her living. Like that's you know was her main source of income. And like all of a sudden, you know YouTube starts getting more Nazistic about certain things and rejecting videos for monetization and whatever. And like she you know she was just kind of freaking out like oh my god you know you know we we live in a world where it takes money to survive what the fuck you know. How am I going to get, you know, bills paid and this and that and so on and so forth? And so she discovered this service called Patreon. And, um, you know, as you can see, it says uh, Nixie is creating videos to make you laugh and learn something. I guess she has that. And, and um, you know, uh, as far as a similarity to Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy, um, Although I don't even think I've ever seen her swear or get really truly politically incorrect like we do. But um, spreading Linux and open source um, awareness one pixel at a time. You know, the minimum you can give is uh, $1 per month, become a patron. And it says she has 716 patrons. And now at current, she is making $8,110 per month. Now... There's a lot of people, from what I have come to understand, that try to use Patreon to, um, you know, get some get support from subscribers, and <clears throat> you know, they get all butthurt because it just doesn't work. You know, they're like, "Well, what the fuck? Other people get it, but not me. What the hell?" And blah blah blah. But if you really look at it, like. If someone's up there just doing nothing but, but fucking whining about how they never get anything and anybody else does, they're just whining, 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 fucking whining. Would that be incentive for for you to give money, any money at all to that person? Of course not. I mean, <laughs> obviously, of course not. But Nixie is very inspiring in the way she presents herself. So yeah, you know. She does have moments where she gets kind of emo about things, as every human being has those moments, but that's not, like, all she does. I mean, she has a generally, you know, positive attitude. And, you know, look at the way she's she's kind of formatted it. Okay, milestone goals, seven, seven milestone goals reached. Um... You know, she she has set certain goals for, for certain things... Um, let's see here. Greetings programs. Who am I? My friends call me Nixie. I've been tech obsessed since birth. See, I remember my mom fleeing open my bedroom door, and Richard is back, fleeing open my bedroom door late at night thinking I was up to no good just to find out I had fallen asleep in a pile of computer manuals. Twenty some years later, and I'm still uh, alerting but now I teach others to what I do. If my business cards were accurate, they would read, Hi, I'm N Nixie Pixel on YouTube since 2007. Producer, writer, videographer, editor, open, open source advocate, technology enthusiast, tech support, host, all the things. I have two shows. One is called OS Alt for Open Source Alternative, and Geek Buzz, my gaming and tech channel. I've been running them both for six years on my own. My drive, creating videos that make geeks laugh and learn something. Like this one, for example. Why should I care about Steam OS? 
um, why I need your help. To be honest, there's not m much money to be made when you talk about free and open source projects. It has been a labor of love, but I've always been able to get by until now. YouTube's been going through some drastic changes since I started six years ago. False copyright claims against my videos, my ad revenue nose diving, just to name a few. This has hit me so hard, I have been seeking other, empl other employment just to make ends meet. Wait a minute. Why have I been chasing support from companies who don't care instead of people who do? Who am I trying to teach in the first place? You. You've been all I've cared about. If this was Tron, I'd be Flynn, unwilling to be swallowed up by, big fish corp by a big fish corporation. I want to say, back off, big fish. I fight for the users, not NCOM. Nixie Pixel. Oh, and don't worry. Any currency is accepted and gets automatically converted into dollars. Give what you can, but there's no pressure. My normal videos will always be free, and I hope that you find them as amusing and useful as I find it fun to create them. Thanks so much for reading. Nicole Allen, Nixie Pixel. And apparently there's a picture that's not showing up here, linedivider.png. Okay. Rewards. Edit. Here's a live stream to help answer questions and comments. Have a look. And let's face it, there's not much apparel out there to specific to Linux and open source geeks. I've worked really hard to change that. Those who pledge on the master control program level or above will receive a special high quality t-shirt designed by me. Many more prizes below. Check it out. If you have any questions, just send me an email here and I'll do my best to answer them. Then she's got all the different rankings. Pledge a dollar or more per month. And there's 211 patrons that apparently have done this. Um, disc Primitive. For less than a cup of coffee, you get access to my patron activity stream. This is where I'll post exclusive video updates, photos, and general geeky brainstorming goodness. You can, uh, you can have a say in my future content. My unending gratitude for I can now rest easy knowing where my next meal will come from. Pledge $3 or more per month, and there's 97 patrons who have done this. Space Cowboy, invited to a monthly patron Q&A, ask me anything, access to my Patreon activity stream. <laughs> Pledge $5 or more per month. Interestingly enough, 173 patrons have done this digitized. One hour live show every month just for patrons. Let's hang out. We'll talk tech. I'll answer your questions, chat about what I plan for the show, and more. I may even drag you to webcam chat live with me. Exclusive IRC invitation. We're always chatting. IRC stands for Internet Re Relay Chat, for those of you who um, are not familiar with the acronym. Monthly Q&A access to my Patreon activity stream. Pledge $10 or more per month, which 126 patrons have apparently done. Matrix Blaster, an exclusive high-res digital photo of your choice from my charity photo shoot. I will give a portion of your pledge to my favorite charity, OLPC, which stands for One Laptop Per Child. Um, exclusive IRC invitation, we're always chatting, monthly live show, Q&A, access to patron stream. Okay, pledge 35 or more per month. 36 patrons have done this, and apparently that, uh, that pledge is limited to 64 of 100 left. Um, I guess that's like the, the equivalent of one of those like, you know, limited time offer sales, uh, so to speak, um, that tends to keep to get people buying a little faster. Stores use that all the time. Um, master control program, epic high quality programming shirt designed by me. Um, yes, I will ship internationally if you don't mind paying the cost of twelve fifty. I'll find working on cheaper I'll find uh, yeah, I'll work on finding cheaper options. 
Um, you know, and of course, all the other previous things are included as listed. Pledge 50 or more per month. Five patrons have done this apparently. Um, Game Grid God, there's no way I can truly thank you enough, but I will try. You will receive your name or business in the end credits of all my pledge videos like this. Shout out of your name or business on the social media site of your choice. I use them all. And, you know, all the before mentioned. Then pledge 100 or more per month. Um, nine patrons, um, uh, limited uh, 31 of 40 or left. The uh, Electronic Gladiator, one custom-made video personalized just for you upon request, one dedicated chat tech support session upon request, your name or business in the end credits of all my pledge videos, and et cetera, et cetera, everything that, that was just previously um, mentioned. Now, let's just kind of look at this and think to yourself, and just look at the way she's just authentically expressed herself and how she's creatively, you know, designed all these different levels and described them. It's like, even if you're not really sure who, who Nixie is and even if you're broke, doesn't it really just, like, stir up this this urge inside of you that like almost instantly wants to make you just like put in that like one dollar and freaking click it of course it does because look at how she presented herself it's completely fucking badass now of course to someone whining like a little bitch about how they never make anything and how they never will and blah 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 whine 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 just give me money whine 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 um, does that have that feeling of oh yeah I just want to give them a dollar of course not it has more of a feeling of, of, of like taking a wrong bad turn into the ghetto and you're walking down the street and five panhandlers come up to you at the same time going you got a dollar you got a dollar I mean come on you know Let's be realistic about this. Now, of course, people that you know may very well have it, just as badass of talent as Nixie here, but they're feeling like really down on themselves, might look at all this and be butthurt. Like, oh man, she's got 716 patrons and she's making 8,110 a month now, and everybody else always, you know, gets lucky but me and blah blah blah. Why don't you try to look at it from Nixie's point of view and from her paradigms and her, her belief systems. Prior to all this, she was believing that she was struggling and suffering, just trying to do what she loved doing, taking all this flack for being a chick, being a geek nerd chick and YouTube fucking with her and, and just everything else. She was just in a total paradigm of poor little me, self-loathing, defeatism, but she rose above it, tried to give this a try. Now imagine being her that, you know, first you're in a moment of wondering where your next meal is coming from, then you decide to try this just for the fuck of it, and then all of a sudden, total paradigm cognitive dissonance, all of a sudden 716 patrons, $8,110 per month, and rising, and you're just looking at it as your head spinning in total disbelief, like, oh my god, one moment I was wondering where my next meal is going to come from, and the next moment I have the total opposite, just because I decided to just try this, just for the hell of it, hey, let's give it a go, what's the worst that could happen, right? So if you look at it from her perspective, if you really try to do that, her head is spinning right now. She's not sitting there thinking, oh, look at me. I have these stats. Aha, I'm so good and great. I'm making this now. I'm better than everyone. Ha, ha, ha. I am Nixie. I am blah, blah, blah. No, her head is fucking spinning. She can probably barely fucking walk straight. Her head is spinning so much because she's just gone from one type of reality to its complete total opposite like that, half of what she thought she ever knew about reality being completely defied and instantaneously destroyed. So yeah, 
I mean, I highly doubt that she's sitting there like, you know, I'm so great. If I were her, I'd be sitting there with my eyeballs hanging out of my sockets, my brain just having imploded in a total state of what the fuck is this even really happening to me. That's where I'd be. So there are so many, and uh, someone's messaging me here. Um, one second. Um, okay, let's see here. Hang on right now. You're welcome to join us. Boom. There we go. Gave her the link. Okay. <clears throat> Alrighty, sorry about that. So, anyways, um, moving on here. So, I just kind of wanted to use this as like a primary example because there's a lot of artists on DeviantArt who like try to do this stuff, but because of, you know, they've got this total misery belief system. You know, they never get anywhere with it. And though Nixie, she doesn't have a total misery belief system, still, you know, there's still a lot of paradigms she's dealing with, as are all humans dealing with them. And, you know, it's just not realistic, you know, like this sort of thing to happen for most people. It's just not. And so I can imagine you know, it happening to her and her head's like completely freaking spinning right now. Like, wow. Um, one second here. Um, and apparently Desiree's out right now, so she can't. Well, that's understandable. You know, she's out somewhere, she's out somewhere. Okay. I, even though I told her that I'm going to hang out, I think it might be polite to just add the extra little, um... Somebody just join us here. Okay, word. I heard like a little ching from somewhere. I thought somebody else had joined us, but apparently not. Okay, um, just so you know, I'm in screen share mode. Um, so, She could join us, you know, instead of just sitting there in her little misery bubble talking about how life's so horrible. She could talk to two cool people who'd support her and whatever situation she's in, but I guess not. She said, My life's going to be public soon after Comic Con next month. LOL, I'm hanging out with 
Michael Rooker, Norman Reedus, celebs. Mm. Apparently, so celeb. I've never heard of them. Um, is he? I guess this is kind of like in perfect synchronicity with what we're talking about on this topic, too. Because, I mean, you know, Ashley's tried, you know, in Power Network, and she's tried a whole bunch of, you know, different things for making money and, you know, being happy and so on and so forth. And, like, I've done my best to explain the quantum mirror aspect and about belief systems and, um and so on and so forth, and I've done, you know, all I can to answer her questions on that the best I can, but, you know, there's very much been, you know, just, uh, just that Im embedded, you know, self-victimization sort of thing, and, you know, that's been her most real reality, so obviously it's it's been a challenge for her to kind of shift that maybe some other reality might able to be real too. So she's been kind of locked in. And, you know, she's been in a, in a bad, you know, abusive, you know, relationship, which of course, is, you know, just does absolute wonders for self-esteem, especially when it's a chick. Guys too, of course, it's a human thing, but, you know... But chicks tend to take that sort of thing harder than guys, typically. So, yeah, I mean, I feel compassion for her, and I understand, you know, her situation. But, you know, at the same time, physics works how it works. And if someone wants to remain trapped in that, I can't, I'm miserable, this is reality sort of belief system, then the universe is not going to pull you aside for a cup of coffee and be like, hey, I don't like your belief systems here. We need to talk about you changing it. You know, the universe isn't a Nazi. So I guess this is kind of in in alignment with what we're talking about, you know, here with all the stuff that I've just been kind of rambling about here. Which again, you know, leads me into what I was going to say as far as things being signposts. Um, you know, we've all we've all gone through it to where it's like we see the signposts where our reality is, is trying to tell us, hey, look at all these things you might want to consider that actually do work. Look at all these different types of people you could align with. You know, We're getting little signposts, almost like you're driving on the highway and you're looking for your exit, and you see a sign that says, okay, your exit is coming up you know, a half mile the next right, right? And... You know, people take it as, oh my god, woe is me, I'm never going to get there, and I, I just may as well just, you know, turn off my engine and pull over to the side of the road and just stay here because, oh, woe is me, you know, I'm never going to get there. They're not understanding that the signpost is saying that your destination is a half mile on the right, it's, it's the next exit coming up, and, you know, like, we don't think of it in terms that when we see people around us starting to gain ground and, and being a little more successful or, you know, we run into things like maybe Nixie's patron page or Patreon page to where, you know, we see her success level. We don't take it as, oh, well, maybe the universe is actually kind of trying to show me that other things are possible. Maybe it's you know, the reflection is that if I present myself in a more honest and genuine manner, but while at the same time not going all total, like, pity party on everybody all the time, maybe if I use my, my creativity and act in the direction I want to create, then maybe things will start shifting. And I know that there's, there's a part of my ego that, like wants to look at this and go, oh my god, you know, of course, you know, people like her get all the luck, and she's like a hot chick, so sure, of course she's got all this luck, and 
so on and so forth. And like, you know, it's a part of my ego that, that does want to go there. But the greater part of me knows that the crock of shit. The greater part of me knows that logically none of those things have to really do with, with anything. You know. And when we really take a look at the at the broader view, I mean you know, despite, you know, her being like, you know, really hot and tech savvy and, and whatever else, if she didn't choose to present herself in the way that she presents herself, if she was just constantly on like a emo pity party with narrowed beliefs about reality, no one would want to listen to her. There's like plenty of really hot, talented chicks out there that I see that no one fucking wants to listen to because all they fucking do is just go on this pity party and when anyone tries to be their friend, well, that's not a real reality for them. So they just shun it and go, no, no, no. Or when anybody tries to suggest anything, it's like, it's like, no, no. There's only one type of wolfing farm, goddammit, it, and it sucks. And I already know what it is. So fuck you. I'm William Black and I know it all. And okay, I'm being a little exaggerative there, but you know, it's like, it's, it's that sort of thing to where, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if, like, you know, a chick is super hot with big boobs and sexy and whatever. It doesn't matter if a a guy is like fucking, you know, you know, Tom Cruise, the next generation, or what the fuck. If someone's just like they're just being all like pity party and refusing to accept any input that doesn't match their existing misery paradigm, then people are just gonna, you know, shrug their shoulders, not knowing what the fuck to do, and they're gonna walk away. So I just want to kind of point that out right now that just because, you know, Nixie's like really hot and tech savvy and a gamer and, you know, all that, that, you know, these these things alone are not why she's having the successes that she is. It's because she's she's building up her confidence and she's being honest and authentic and she's really looking to move forward in the direction that she wants to, to go in. And she's not sitting there just like, oh, poor little me. There's all these sexist fucking perverts around me who talk all sorts of poo-poo. And that's my only real reality. So I may as well just call it quits right now and da-da-da-da-da. She's not doing that. Look at how absolutely inspirational her shit is. Look at the way she presents herself. She's presenting herself aw awesomely. And even though she has all this skill and ability to present herself this awesomely, if she decided to choose that her only real reality was a uh, reality was never ending fucking pity party she wouldn't be using that skill and that talent she wouldn't even know she has it she'd just be too focused on pity party poor little me i'm average life fucking sucks wah 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 and so she wouldn't have pages that look awesome and badass like this that are well spoken and and so on and so forth. She wouldn't even realize she has talent if she was so stuck in this misery paradigm. And, you know, that's where I see a lot of people stuck at. They have talent. You try to tell them that, <laughs> they don't believe you. You know, and they have the ability to do stuff like this. You try to tell them that, <laughs> they don't believe you. That's not their reality. All they've seen is just shit and misery and filth and, and fuck my life and da 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 and that is all they're willing to see is, is their reality. I know that like, you know, at first and even still a little bit now, you know, like, you know, Rich would start to have more, you know, cute girls gravitating around him, which was a positive signpost. And then, you know, part of them would look at it like, oh, well, they just want to be friends. And, you know, and I, I'd like a girlfriend and da-da-da. So this is my reality telling me that I'm not worthy of having a girlfriend and da-da-da. And, you know, Ego wants to get all fucking, you know, whiny bitch fit like Anakin Skywalker or something. But the greater part of Rich knows that it's just a signpost. It's just like, okay, it's showing me that I'm going from... A reality where girls either don't give a shit or, you know, they're all, you know, dysfunctional basket cases moving out of that reality into a reality where there's more females that have tact and integrity. So the greater part of Rich is seeing, okay, these are signposts that are saying I'm on this journey, this highway of life, and I'm getting closer and closer to my preferred destinations with every mile that goes by. It just it takes time to you know, to, to travel that. So, what do you have to say on all of this, Rich? 
Not much. I'm kind of just baked right now. <laughs> well, you and me both. I mean, I'm tired and groggy and can barely think straight, so that's okay. Don't hold judgment about yourself on that. Just speak anyway. Well, yeah, I'm pretty much in agreement with you. I mean, you know, it is what it is, and, you know, um, yeah, I mean, life's, life's a journey, and you got to be willing to, you know, you got to be willing to go. You, you can't just stop when you see the first signpost that says 500 miles to go, you know, you got to keep going until you reach whatever destination you set in your mind, you know. Ashley, you go on vacations, you know. Ashley's here. Hey, Ashley. Oh, hello, Ashley. We're not hearing her. Anyway, you know, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, you don't, you don't freaking, you don't go for, uh, you don't start an awesome vacation and then get that first signpost and like, you know, like you said, turn the car off and say, fuck this, we're never going to get to Disney World or the Kennedy Space Center and see a cool ass rocket launch or whatever. I mean, you know, people just don't do that. People go on the adventure, they go on the journey wherever it might lead and, Fortunately, I think society is moving in a direction where they realize, you know, hey, you got to start the journey and you got to go on the journey and stay committed instead of judging it right away and saying, you know, fuck this because da 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 da. And, you know, people are starting to realize, hey, you know, I can do this. And they're not doing the Anakin Skywalker routine of, you know, oh, well, because. I didn't get to the destination right away, right fucking now. You know, they're not they're not bitch fitting and throwing a, a rage quit, if you will. So, yeah, I mean, pretty much what you said was right on. So, you know, that's pretty much the gist of it. I wonder if Ashley has anything to add. She's here. It says her microphone is disabled. Video is most certainly disabled. Um, it says she's present and, and accounted for as far as being logged into the system here, but um, I'm getting no response. Ashley, are you here? Hmm. Interesting. I'm not kidding. Maybe Google's just fucking up and her bandwidth is so bad that it doesn't matter if she's here in technicality or not. I don't know. I mean, I think if Google was bombing her out, it wouldn't, like, just silence her microphone. I think it would, it would do what it has done plenty of times before that we've seen in the past to where it's like, it's showing the person as here and wide open, but really it's just like in the process of like kicking them out, and all of a sudden we see, doop, you know, left chat, and then they try to come back and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe she just joined it and then had to like go use the bathroom or something. I I have no idea. I'm not on her. I'm not over there by her, so I I can't really attest to you know what you know she's doing at the moment or not. I really have no idea. I guess if um, if she's here and she's listening, then she is. And if she wants to speak up and say something, then she will. And we'll just kind of leave it at that. Oh, we got a... Looks like we have a message from her on Facebook. Try joining, but energy-wise, negative isn't going to connect. Um, and
that's interesting. Okay, well, uh, apparently there is someone having an, a verbal argument with her at the moment, so apparently it's a good thing that her, her mic is, is muted. <laughs> Otherwise, she'd have had to exit the chat anyway. Hmm. Alrighty. Well, as the famous video says, circumstances don't matter. Only state of being matters. Uh -huh. Well, that's an that's um, about an understanding of, of physics. It's not really to be, um, shall we say, taken in a in a new agey sort of way. Um, a lot of the new agers like to go on this, you know, love and light shun the dark sort of policy, and it's about the equivalent of ignoring the roaches while they're breeding in the walls and thinking, if I ignore the roaches, then they will go away and exit my reality. No, they will have lots of little baby roaches who will quickly grow up and have lots more little baby roaches until you've denied the dark side so much that it can't help but just jump right up in your face and just wham! <laughs> okay. Now it says Ashley is here with Mike unmuted, but I'm still hearing nothing. Interesting. I don't know if there's any technical glitches involved with this or not, or whatever. But anyway, the, um, the main point of this uh, discussion topic, and as far as it being titled about the signpost uh, just up ahead there, is that a lot of times we see, you know, reality trying to clue us into some very, very good, very positive things. But, um, you know, when we're stuck in these paradigms of, oh, you know, only shit and misery is the only real reality and that's it, then, you know, we take a lot of these signposts to their equal and opposite meaning. So, you know, we see a signpost that's trying to tell us, hey, we're moving in a good direction. And we take it to its opposite. Like, oh, that good direction's apparently over there and I'm over here. So that means I'll never get to that good direction. Oh, woe is me. I'm such a victim and poop poopy doo and whatever, so then, you know, we pull our car to the side of the road, metaphorically speaking, and sit there and pout and, you know, just totally, totally taking it to its opposite intended meaning. Um, kind of like the, the old saying about, you know, how misery loves company. That's really just all about the paradigms, because when someone's in a paradigm to where they see misery as the only real reality, then... Anything that's that's opposite that, that's out, that's outside of that box, it really just looks like a crock of shit. So it's like it, it, anything that is not of that misery paradigm, when it tries to approach that box and you know let that box know, hey, there there's more outside. In fact, there is an outside. Then anything inside of that box is like, no, there isn't. Shut up. That's just bullshit. That's delusional. That's airy fairy, that's whatever, or that happens to everybody else but me. God hates me, the universe hates me, nothing good ever can happen to me, blah, 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 get out of here. So, I mean, understandably, I mean, it's really understandable as to how it can be taken to its opposite and how it can just, you know, sound like total shit because, you know, what we're taught in life is all we know until or unless we choose to learn other things. So if all we've been taught is that reality sucks, that's it, that's the only reality, and all we've learned is how to survive within that sucky reality, and, and that, that's it, that's all we know, then anything outside of that feels as if we are not simply exiting our, our comfort zone, but exiting our safety zone. 
you know, as if something horrible is going to happen to us if we have the audacity to exit our misery. You know, like, oh, well, it might feel good for a while and it might work for a while, but then something inevitably is going to come and shoot it down. And then I'm going to hurt even more than I did before I even tried, so why fucking bother, you know, and like all that sort of programming. And it's like, yeah, when we're impatient and we have this instant gratification drive and, you know, we expect to plant the tree seed today and have it be a 40-foot tree tomorrow and all these unreasonable explanations, yeah, when, or expectations, yeah, when we proceed forward in that, then we're going to make a lot of stupid mistakes based on negligence and impatience and we're going to trip and fall and fuck ourselves up in that way. And then instead of taking responsibility for ourselves and say, hey, if we would have just, like, you know, taken a chill pill and allowed things to transition at an ease and flow pace instead of trying to rush it, then, yeah, it probably would have worked out. And instead of facing the idea that, okay, we made some mistakes and that's why it screwed up and that if we would have just been calmer and more patient with ourselves, then everything probably would have been fine. If we could own that, then we can go ahead and try it again, and then, you know, at some point it will end up being fine. But ego doesn't want to do that. Ego wants to completely ignore all that. It wants to go see all that on the external. That's why it failed. I'm a victim. The universe hates me, and it doesn't matter what I do. This external monster is always going to come and ass rate me, and that's it. That's reality. I don't want to hear anything else. Everything else just fucking go away. So it's like that's this attitude that we're trapped into. It's like it's like telling a little kid that they can't have ice cream before dinner and they have to have an ass after dinner, and the little kid reacting as if like the world has just fucking ended. That's, that's the way we're trained to be. Adulthood really is a state of extended adolescence, which continues to exponentially compound upon itself with ever-increasing interest, like the Federal Reserve fucking monetary system, you know? Rich? Yep. I have Right now, so I'm just kind of half distracted. In the middle of a game called Woofing Farm? Yep, Woofing Farm 2. <laughs> Did you hear anything that I said? Part of it, yeah. Kind of, sort of. Subconsciously, at least. I think. You think? Mm -hmm. Is this topic being a little too reflective for you, Rich, that maybe you don't even want to pay attention to it? Nah, nah I'm just complacent right now. Totally complacent. Just like, fine. I'm just like, all sorts of fine right now. Just enjoying life. Oh, okay. Because I know that there are certain other people that we won't mention that um, they have a tendency to just kind of immerse themselves in a game instead of facing certain things. Oh, no, I ain't German keyboard kid, okay? I'm not the German keyboard kid who's screaming and all sorts of German at his computer and slamming his keyboard. And... Oh, no, I wasn't talking about that. Wasn't talking about that at all. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, let me take a look quickly. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, sometimes people like to use video games to get distracted away from things when things come up. To <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not playing War Thunder, so or World of Tanks. So, what are you playing? Playing Black Ops too. Uh. Multiplayer. And I'm just having fun. That's all. I'm not raging. I'm just having fun. 
which is what these are meant for. Well, why, why, why would the other two games be about raging, but this one isn't? Oh, well, no, this game is a, can be quite rageful for quite a lot of people. It's just, it's all about state of mind. It's all about state of mind. As far as I know, this is the uh, the first time that you've ever chosen to dive into a, uh, a game in the middle of a Google Hangout. That I know of. Yeah, I think you're right. I guess, I, that is, I guess that's a synchronistic message in a sense, maybe. That's like another road sign, if you will. <laughs> I, was just, I was just kind of noticing that and thinking, wait a minute, is this a reaction to a signpost here? No. It's is maybe it reacting maybe. subconsciously? <laughs> I don't know. It's a possibility. I, it hadn't crossed my mind until now. I was just thinking about that. It could be a signpost. I'm not raging against it. Maybe this little tiny voice in my head is, but it's nothing too substantial. Usually when people kind of rage against the signposts, it's like they don't even know they're doing it. Obviously, if they knew they were doing it, this entire topic would be, like, irrelevant. <laughs> uh-huh. It would be completely irrelevant to point these things out if they were at the top of everyone's awareness. So I just find it interesting that while we were in the middle of exactly this sort of a topic, you kind of pull your car over at the signpost and trade it out for a tank or whatever it is you're using in the game. <laughs> That's a fun... Uh, hey, I mean, I'm stopping at a landmark. What can I say? i got to take a break from the drive, you know? <laughs> okay, so... Anyway, apparently you took a break from the conversation as well, seeing as you didn't hear anything of what I previously said. But seeing as you picked it up subconsciously anyway, let's see if your subconscious will rise any thoughts to your conscious and maybe you want to say a few words on the topic. Seeing as I was intending on giving my voice a break for a few minutes. You can think of some real-life examples you want to share, either of your own experiences or other people you've known that have uh, reacted that way or whatever. Don't have to name any names, of course, just giving off examples of circumstances, not necessarily people. I'm just with the signposts and all that stuff. Yeah. To where how you've seen people react to it and misunderstand it and, you know, all of that. Like reactions that you've observed, whether it's reactions that you know that you've had yourself or whether it's what you've observed in others. But if it's with others, you don't have to, like, you know, air, you know like list the people, you know, and just describe the circumstance that you observe. Well, as we were talking about the Woofing Farms thing, I know me and you had both talk to a certain individual who rages against the idea, you know, we try to present ideas of, you know, ways that this person can get out of a situation with family and yet they ignore all advice like it was never given. It's unfortunate, you know, but it's their choice. I do believe it's based on a belief system that because he knows how one particular type of farm operates, that he assumes that all farms everywhere operate in exactly the same way. Therefore, if he hated the one experience, then he's going to hate all other possibilities for that experience. Yeah. And of course, I've had 
family members who have acted that way, you know, you present new ideas or new ways of doing things and they automatically assume, oh, poo poo on you, you can't think that or do that or act that way, that's not right, not okay, you're delusional, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's ridiculous, you know. It's absolutely ridiculous. And that you're supposedly being controlled by a CIA operative. Yeah, let's jump the black helicopter train. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, it's it's childish in a sense. You know, they rage against a, a healthy signpost in a good direction. They don't even realize what direction they're going in. It's like essentially stepping into a car metaphorically with a blindfold on and, you know, driving off a cliff and landing in the middle of a lava bed and going, you know, why is it so hot? You know, what the fuck? What the hell? I'm supposed to know exactly where I am with my blindfold on and, you know, have my hands tied behind my back and driving and steering the steering wheel with my teeth, you know? Because that's just how you drive, right? <laughs> Test. I mean, it's honest how to drive, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. And and you're and, and, and to top it all off, you're driving a car that's uh, made in China and has Microsoft Sync inside of it, you know, <laughs> and and it just gets worse from there. <laughs> but um, you know. And people wonder why things are going so wrong and things are going so bad. And it's like, well, you got to kind of, you got to kind of take the blindfold off and untie your hands, as it were, before you can, you know, really start the journey and you know, get to the destination, as it were. You know, and I and I, and when I was younger, you know, I, when I'd rage, it was a lot more substantial and childish and stupid and, you know, it just happened and that's what happened, you know. And it wasn't until I realized that I myself had a blindfold on and had my hands tied behind my back and, you know, was driving a piece of crap car with Microsoft Sync in it that I wasn't getting anywhere and I wasn't going to get anywhere by sitting there throwing a bitch fit about it. I just had to, you know, take the blinders off and observe and because, my and because, things and wonder, and, 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 and then ask the man on the street for directions, you know, i.e. my friends or Dave Kelso, Time Warrior, you know, like, okay, what part of the city am I in? And then they give you a map and, oh God, maybe a Garmin GPS and a nice new car to drive and it's like, oh, now I know where I'm at. So all of the stuff that I've been learning that's been healthy for me for the longest time, you know, that I was raging against, actually is helpful. Gee, hmm, who would have thunk it? And, well... The psychological play. projections are fun. Uh, because misery loves company, it's like, as soon as you start moving in a more positive direction, everybody that wants you to remain in the negative starts telling you about how you're being so negative and you need to have a, a better positive outlook on life. And and they're like, you know, like screaming at you. Like, we, we've all dealt with these types of people. Like, oh, you yeah. Know. Yeah. Certain phone conversations that I've had with certain family members, you know, scream and yell at me on the phone about how I'm being negative and condescending and spiteful and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm moving on with my life, I'm doing my thing, I don't need to hear it, you know. I'm just being cool and I'm just doing what I'm going to do and, you know, take care of business and, yeah. you know, just living I, life to the fullest every day, you know. That was one of my major, like, you know, setbacks in my life too and, and you know, I'm sure everybody's familiar, you know, with this sort of thing on some level or another where... At first, everybody's trying to tell you, oh, you need to be more productive, do this, do that, learn this, learn that, and, you know, how horrible you supposedly are for not doing it. Then, when you start doing it, you know, they get they get a little scared, like, oh, shit, he's moving in a, in a positive direction, a better direction, I'm not, which automatically makes him a threat, because then that means he has a high ground, and I don't. So then they start, like, you know, projecting and raging, and just being like, oh, you shouldn't do that, because that's going to fail, and that's not going to work, or, or you're being deceived, or that's communism, or the government's going to get you, or whatever ridiculous, paranoid, fucking 
you know, outburst that their brain decides to, like, you know, launch at you through the anus of their face called a mouth at the time, and, you know, it's like, blah, 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 and, you know, trying to, like, bring you back down to their level. And, you know, I remember that's, that's one thing in the past that used to keep me stuck because it's like I'm thinking, well, no matter if I stay where I am, people are going to say how horrible of me, but then if I try to do better... They're going to say how horrible of me, and no matter what, they're going to say, oh, how terrible, you bad, horrible person you. And so, you know, it kept me stuck for a while until I started realizing, like, wait a minute. Well, they have the right to think what they want to think, and I have the right to go ahead and do what I want anyway. And then when I started making progress and was able to show them, look, see here, here's progress, it does work. And then they were kind of like forced to shut the fuck up and back off because they really couldn't argue with the, with the data. I remember when I started... You know, moving into, like, making money on YouTube and stuff, there were people who were like, well, it's not a real job, and you can't make anything, and you're getting your hopes up, and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, then I was able to show them my YouTube stats and, you know, show them fucking 1040, you know, freaking paperwork from, you know, from Google, and, you know, show them screen captures from my online baking and things like that. And they were just kind of forced to shut the fuck up. Or the other thing would, would be like, oh, well... Well, you know, that's that's not tons and tons of money and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, look, you know, it's more than your average, you know, dipshit, you know, working part-time at, you know, fucking a Walmart makes. The only difference is, like, they're fucking being slaving and, a, and, you know, someone else's, you know, work slave bitch and busting their ass and suffering and fucking misery to make their money and, like... You know, I'm making that, if not more, doing things that I enjoy doing. So it's like, why does it only count as having a job if you're suffering in fucking emotional and psychological and physical fucking misery, being someone's slave? Why does that count as being an honest living? But if you're not doing that, then oh, it's it's somehow like not right. And I just think that's that's way too funny. And it's even more funny when it comes from these these truthers, these wannabes that they're raging against a system and they're talking about the Federal Reserve and they're talking about government and corporate corruption and how we need to stop being slaves of the system. But as soon as anybody starts to free themselves a little bit, it's like, oh, you're doing something dishonest because the only way to be honest is to be a slave of the system that I personally am raging against and saying we need to fight. But, you know, because it's only lip service, anybody who actually tries to fight it and do something different, well, they're being dishonest and they're a scammer and they're lacking integrity because obviously the only honest right way to make a living is be a slave to your enemy. It doesn't make any fucking sense. It's totally neurotic. Yeah, it's neurotic and it's called Stockholm Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Protective user. You know, it's very typical of human beings when they're given an opportunity. You know, especially in the current societal paradigms in which we live. I mean, you know, people you give them the opportunity to think critically or think about something or re-analyze something and think for themselves, they just automatically rage quit and go, you know, fuck you, you can't do that, blah, 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 this is stupid, you're stupid, I hate you, blah, 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 you know. And then they deny that they're saying any of that in front of you and act like they're being mature and adults about it and they're <laughs> accusing you of being a child and it's like, no, I'm just asking questions here here and trying to be civil. I'm just observing your actions, not my actions, your actions. Nothing offends a control freak more than than calmly asking reasonable questions. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, it's like how dare you ask questions, you know, what does God need with a starship? Who is this creature? Zap. Ask those questions. Those questions aren't allowed. But it's really just a, a psychological, pathological meme. You know, the meme of abuse is to where if someone who's abused doesn't, you know, find a way to get out of that meme, then oftentimes they become abusers themselves. You know, I, I've seen it to where, like, you know, someone... You know, either their parents or 
other family members or so-called friends or, or whatever, people that, you know, were a constant influence on them were being abusive and, you know, obviously the person being abused would, you know, be bitching about it, like, oh, how dare them and they don't have the right and why me and poor old me and whatever else, but then, you know, then they usually, like, after that end up, you know, hooking up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife or whatever that has similar abusive patterns because that form of abuse is really all they know, that's all they know to look for in people. They don't really have any experience with, you know, seeking out anything better because that's like totally foreign to them. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what it's about. It's totally outside of their reality. So people go with what they know. And so then they get, you know, hooked up with someone who is of that abusive mentality and then, you know, maybe they have a kid and then, you know, finally that that kid starts to break the cycle, you know, of of abuse and starts going in a better direction. And so then the parent is seeing the kid as like a threat, like, oh, my God, my child now has the high ground. Uh, and, and they're thinking the only reality I know is to maintain control over my reality by controlling others. And and now that that's gone, and it's going to upset the entire fabric of the family structure because that's how the entire family operates and you know if that one black sheep so to speak is going to exit the abuse paradigm then the entire family structure is going to fall apart and it, it, it's so true it does it does fall apart it's interesting because there's usually at least one key person that is kind of you know selected as being the focus and or cause of drama, so and then there's another person who's kind of like the main puppeteer, so to speak. So then they can push, pull, and maneuver that one person as a chess piece to then upset the rest of the family structure and basically almost like the globalist elites controlled chaos. And um, if their if their chess piece ends up exiting the game, so to speak and they don't have any replacement chess piece, then they have put, you know, they have basically um, conditioned their lives around the idea that my life depends upon being able to control this chess piece. So now that chess piece is gone, so all the pretenses, all the structure, all their normal mode of operation within themselves, within their family, within their friends, it all starts to, to crumble and collapse and deteriorate. And then all of a sudden everybody's, you know, seeing them more and more as a control freak. And now all of a sudden the control freak has consequences for their actions. Oh, Ashley's gone. Um, now the control freak has consequences, you know, for their actions because now their, their little chess piece that they used to be able to maneuver in order to avoid consequences because they were using that chess piece to manipulate the whole game around them. Now their sense of control is gone, so now all consequences collapse, you know, back onto them because they don't have that linchpin keeping things in place. Now it's all just it's uncontrolled chaos instead of controlled chaos. And I think uh, you know somebody who's currently going through that. Uh huh. I do. We won't mention her name, though. <laughs> we'll just say watch the video December Strangeness if you want to know more. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. It's in the PSEC 2014 area of things. It's been an interesting learning experience and just being able to see all of this, you know, so much more clearly and how much of what used to depend upon what and how it was all like a house of cards and you pull one key card out from the house and the whole thing just starts to collapse. Uh-huh. And that's really the Achilles heel of the pyramid structure of the elites too. You know, what happens when you knock out one of the rows of the pyramid? The entire thing is just going to go kaboom. Yep. Burn in on itself. 
and that is what's been happening within society. I mean, hell, just the other day I was, you know, watching, um, oh, I was, I was either watching a new episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Once Upon a Time or whatever it was. Speaking of, another episode of Once Upon a Time should be waiting for me in my DVR whenever I want to watch it. But anyway, it was like, you know, either in the middle or near the end or whatever where they have, you know, the quick little local commercials usually like, you know, news at 10 sort of stuff. And um, one of the things that went by is how an Illinois congressman, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that by that they mean a, you know, a, a congressman from Illinois, and they're not talking about the Illinois House or the Illinois Senate. They're talking about the big one. Um, how one of our representatives is actually resigning and talking about something about, you know, getting outed for some sort of corruption or something like that. So, I mean, even within, within politics, um, there's just all this stuff that's starting to come out and unravel and knock a lot of these people down. So it's very interesting how the corruption of our political systems has start to becoming become more and more clear and awareness of it is rising even in the mainstream. And we start to see more and more of these people getting into trouble. People look at it like, oh no, everything is getting worse, everything's collapsing. It's like I'd say things are getting better. The more people can realize and understand the problems you know, the more equipped we are to do something about them if we choose. I think if things were getting worse, we would we would all be completely oblivious to the problems. We'd think everything was great and wonderful and happy and and oh, everything's fine. What are you talking about? You conspiracy theorist, not you know. <laughs> If things were getting worse, then we'd still be locked into that that oblivious haze. But I say things are getting better because of the the rising of awareness. I'd say that means things are getting better, not worse. Because now we're realizing more and more the fullness of the, the corruption and the bullshit and how things operated and just how big of a mess we've made for ourselves and I think in increasing awareness of that means the world is getting better. What do you think? Rich? Uh -huh. yep. The planet is right, you know, the planet's uh Energetics are rising, and yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess you could say we're just noticing people with lower energetic um, influences raging against it, like toddlers. You know, you can't get mad at a toddler for stomping its feet because it can't get the cookie. You just take care of business and you know let the toddler tire itself out. Yep. And all these old systems that no longer serve are kind of exactly like that. Only, you know, they, they tantrum with, you know, false flags and, um, you know, executive orders and <laughs> things like that, but it's bad, still tantrum. Bad, bad court rulings that negatively, negatively affect citizens in small ways, you know, confiscating people's gun rights over hearsay, you know, things of that nature. And of course, I have personal experience on that front. It's not fun having the system just kind of, you know, break your rights, as it will, as it were. You know, You're so good. Good. I say so. You can't present any evidence. Fuck you. Get out of my court. I'm just totally having your due process completely just railroaded. Uh, that is very common. I see so much of that these days. It's not even fucking funny. I wouldn't even say it's a, a daily occurrence. I'd say it's hourly or minutely. 
that has become so prevalent that you know a lot of these judges just have no respect for people's rights, and it's like, okay, it's my courtroom, and I can do what I want, and so I will, and fuck you. And that's the attitude of a lot of these judges. Uh -huh. I don't need to see evidence. I don't need to, um, you know, look into what the actual laws are, or actually yeah. look into anything. I'm just gonna, you know, just state whatever my opinion is and rule on it, because I am God, and this is my universe of my courtroom, and you're in my courtroom, so fuck you, you're my bitch. And that's the way they conduct themselves. Uh-huh. Yep, I need to get out for lunch a couple hours early, because I don't feel like doing this, blah, blah, blah. You know. Yep, corruption. Knows no bounds. It's just it's everywhere. You know, I'm just another first-hand example of it. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, it'll pass in a year, and I have faith in you know the future of world politics that eventually things like what happened to me will just be you know erased from my record and forgotten about, and you know yeah. we'll, we'll go on and uh peaceful fashion in a new republic of some sort, you know. Kind of like Connie's, just, Connie's mom is like elderly and extremely obese and in a wheelchair and can't walk and all this other stuff and she was a, a witness to something in this one court case a while back and like, you know, this this freaking, you know, long story short, this freaking bailiff guard, like, got shitty with her and, like, started, like, you know, whooping on her, basically. And then insult added to injury. They, like, charged Connie's mom with um, assault on the uh, on the guard when it, when it happened the other way around. So, I mean, you know, this whole system, it's more like whatever the judge says is all evidence and law be damned, so fuck you. Whatever the judge says he's going to do with you is going to happen with you. doesn't matter if you're innocent, guilty, whatever you are. Nothing matters. If the judge says, I don't like the way you look today, you're getting 30 days in jail, and I'm going to charge you with this, this, and this, whether or not you actually did it, fuck you. Then that's the court system. It's the Star Chamber Court. It's like Nazi Germany. This is what these judges do. This is how they are. This is how they operate. But people don't realize it until they have like this type of experience or they know somebody who's had this type of experience. And it's like a huge wake-up call. Like, holy shit, I thought our courts were supposed to be just and run according to the Constitution and innocent until proven guilty and evidence actually looked at and so on and so forth. Fuck no. Most of these courts are just like, judges like, I am God. What I say goes. I don't like how you look. You're fucking guilty. And I'll dish you out whatever consequence I want. And there's no way you can fight it. Because I'm a part of the court system. And you're not. So fuck you. And like that's the attitude. And it really wakes people up. Uh -huh. Well, the fortunate thing of this is it'll only backfire. You know, the more people have these experiences, the more people will be, you know, um, encouraged to do something, and I don't mean, you know, in a bad way, but I mean, you know, fight it how they can, you know, and if that means vocal expression or, you know, being an artist and, you know, using your creativity somehow to, you know, mm. display your distaste to the system, you know, that's how it's done, you know. <laughs> I think the most important factor, since obviously the enforcers of our law are, are the main um, linchpins here, I think the most important thing is to generate peer pressure against the cops from their friends and family. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like it if, you know, you know... Officer Johnson wakes up for work in the morning, and every morning, you know, little Johnny's like, I'm seeing on the internet about police beating up and killing old ladies and children. You haven't murdered anyone today, have you, Daddy? Or, you know, the wife constantly coming back with, you know, those same sorts of sentiments, and, you know, their friends kind of backing away and giving them weird looks like, well, you know... Um, you know, I'm seeing people that are having all these bad unconstitutional experiences with cops, like, 
you know, I know you're my friend and everything, but, like, you know, if we, like, disagree on a topic, am I going to end up, like, thrown to the ground and tasered and end up in jail for a year because, like, I like Harry Potter and you don't? <laughs> you know, and just everyone just kind of giving these, these cops fucking peer pressure from all angles because, like, when people forget that these cops are just human like anybody else, if you try to approach them and, and talk to them about the stuff and, like, they don't know you and you're not important to them, like... You know, you're going to have no fucking say in that. They're just going to fucking abuse you. You're nobody to them. But, you know, their friends and their family and their children, you know, if the people that they care about and who care about them are constantly approaching them and going, hey, what's up with this? What's up with this? What's up with this? What's up with this? And the cops answers back to their family keep getting, you know, you know, shot down like, you know, like, hey, that's not really an answer. You're just blowing me off here then all these cops are going to start talking to each other like, yeah, maybe we should start straightening things out because, you know, my wife keeps giving me shit. My fam my kids keep giving me shit. My extended family keeps giving me shit. My friends keep giving me shit. And I, I really don't like this. I work I work hard on this job. And then I come home and I I take shit. And I, I can't even tell, tell them, oh, don't worry about it. I'm... I'm I'm talking with my fellow police officers on how to get this corruption rectified and so on and so forth. And, you know, I can't tell them that because I don't like lying directly to their face because we're not having these conversations. So maybe we should start having these conversations, you know. I think peer pressure would be a great way. So I think, you know, the main, I guess, priority target of the targets of the information, the people who really need to get the information on how the real world, world works is, you know, the, the friends and family of these police officers so they can go to these cops and say, hey, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And then maybe the cops can start talking amongst themselves about all the peer pressure they're getting and, and you know, be forced into making a choice. Do they want to be in support of the corrupt corporate police state or do they want to uphold their oath to the Constitution and protect their friends and family like they're supposed to? Yeah, I mean, the first real thing, and I mean, it's really important, you know, is just awareness, you know, make the cops aware. It's like, you know, you join in on this, this is the consequences, you know, you know, it's not, it's not a game, it's not, you know, like a cartoon where you can just be this bad guy with no, no consequences, you know, you will be affecting people in your community and you will be hurting people, you know, if you decide to side with corruption and wicked, you know, wicked people, you know. I mean, you're not only affecting your community, you're affecting your country, you know, and those are the things that need to be presented from, you know, the lowliest person on the street clear up to people who are in positions to do something about it, no matter how small, you know, that what decisions are made do affect people and, you know, you know, whatever you choose affects the outcome, positive or negative, you know. Information is the ultimate power. You know, a lot of a lot of truthers out there say that we need to have a violent revolution and we need to kill a whole bunch of people when we need to shoot and you know, destroy, you know, search and destroy. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what the elites want. They want us to be shooting and killing and maiming each other, you know. It makes us easier to control, you know. And I think sometimes violence is necessary as an absolute last resort. But not well, as yeah, a, it is an absolute last resort, of course. But I mean, you, know, you don't yeah. put a fire extinguisher in your home hoping that you're going to have a fire. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's why the founding fathers gave us the Second Amendment. I mean, you know, it is a fire extinguisher. Yeah. You know. Ironically. But you know. And I think on a, on a small level, there are a lot of cops out there that are awake and figuring it out and realizing, you know, hey, what I do matters. You I've, know, met, I've, I've met a few of those, too. I'm not going to claim that I won't. I've met plenty of cops that are really disgusted with their fellow officers. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen plenty on the Internet, and there are a lot of cops, you know, locally in my community that are that way. They're good guys that, you know, are family people and... 
like their Second Amendment as much as the next guy and, you know, enjoy people who are into it and, you know, want to be and have Second Amendment enthusiast backs, you know. There's a lot of cops out there like that and, you know, more power to them. But, you know, their job especially is to be, you know, diligent and, you know, keeping an eye on their police department and kind of, you know, encouraging other police officers who are kind of on the fence, as it were, as, you know, to what direction to swing towards. Because, I mean, you know, this stuff does matter. I mean, it's not it's not a game, you know. It's a very real um, political deal, you know. It's, it's serious stuff, and it's, you know, life or death. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not just some, you know, it's not just a bunch of small fry, you know, but it's, it's a real, it's a real deal. Yeah. You know? And, you know. That's why the establishment feel, fears county sheriffs more than they fear anybody. Uh-huh. Oh well, yeah, because sheriffs technically are the most powerful people within their counties. You know, if you're the head sheriff, you know, you can even tell the feds to leave. So, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things, you know. And if they don't leave, you have the right to enforce their leaving by whatever means are necessary to get them to leave. Uh -huh. Exactly. Even if that means having a shootout with them. Because uh -huh. then they become basically an enemy invader on, onto, a, onto a territory that's trying to usurp sovereignty, and the sheriff is just protecting the sovereignty of that territory. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah, and it's gonna take it's gonna take small steps in order to make big changes. You know, people in all counties have to unite together on common interests, and you know, figure out who the troublemakers are, and you know, figure out how to deal with them as peaceably as possible. You know, you know, I mean, it's if violence has to be a necessary option. You know. I mean, you got no other choice if you have to take lethal force, you know, to enforce the will of good people, you know, against wicked people, you know. That's what you have to do, but it's just, you know, it's really the awareness that's the major weapon against the globalists. It's informing people, it's, you know, making sure people are aware, people are awake, people are smart, and people know what's going on because the more people awake and in, in turn free themselves, the weaker the globalists become and the less influence they have on the planet. And, you know, given full potential, something like that would, you know, spread to the entire population, per se. And the globalists would just be nothing more than a bunch of tam temper tantruming, whining children at that point, <laughs> and nobody would care. Yeah, you know, best case scenario, but, you know, that, that'll be the main thing, you know. I mean, I look at it this way. If, if even half the people within a city literally, physically stood up and said no to something, what could the cops really do about it? I mean, let's say that city is like a Chicago, like Chicago, like half of Chicago's like, like, what, two million people or something like that? You know, so so two million people are standing there saying no, and, you know, like 3,000 cops are looking at them, and they're going to do what, you know? You know, what are they going to do, start murdering civilians? <laughs> yeah. And even in the worst-case scenario, you know... And that's one thing that, you know, cops, anybody has to think about. I mean, even in the worst case scenario, if some guy, some cop, you know, who's all roided up and thought he was better than shit, you know, decided to do that, it wouldn't go well for him, and it wouldn't go well for the department that hired that guy, you know. It would just, it would, de it would just escalate in the wrong direction for any police department that tried to commit the 
those file acts on people, you know. Yeah. Not and I, as we're PR, not, not only would their public re relations deteriorate into the toilet, but you know, I mean, people would start arming themselves. Yeah. They, they would immediately start distrusting cops, and they would just be like, "Hey." You know, there was, um, you know, two million uh, people peacefully saying no out there, and these cops just decided to start opening fire on them, and they weren't armed or anything, and they were just murdering people left and right just because they were standing there saying saying no and trying to get something done. Well, you know, at that point, it's like, you know, people are going to be like, hey, I don't, I don't trust cops. I'm going to arm myself. So, you know, if I see a cop murdering people, I'm able to stop that murdering cop by putting a bullet through his head, you know, like that sort of thing. Um, if it were to escalate to that, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I mean, as far as I know, it, it hasn't gotten there yet, as far as I know. Um, I haven't heard of, of anything like that where something like that happens in a major city and then everyone decides to like arm up and take that sort of an attitude about it. Um, but I think it's definitely one thing that could possibly happen if things escalated like that, if awareness spread to where you know you could have like two million people out on the street just civilly saying, hey, you know, enough is enough and you know, wanting a peaceful dialogue and if any cops, you know, were to get stupid, then uh, lawsuits against the police department would be the least of the police department's problem. Well, yeah, I mean, there will be repercussions. And not only that, you know, if a cop were that dumb and decided to do something like that, you know, not only would it hurt the good officers out there, it would affect officers' families. It would be, and not only that, there, there are people out there that are crazy enough bats that they would, you know, start loathing for revenge and things of that nature, especially the relatives of those killed, you know. It would just turn into something really ugly and, you know, you'd have people saying, you know, I'm going to get back at them, you know, blah, 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 you know, go find them, find their families and do something horrible or heinous, you know. You might, you um, might, have, a, you might have a lot of cops thinking the same thing and thinking I better resign as a police officer so that nothing happens to me. Uh, you might yeah. might end up like having three quarters of a police force just resigning and then you know the city's like oh shit what are we going to do now? You know the bulk of our police force just put down their badges and walked out the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah I mean it's, it, it, it would just you know and it's the small awareness, things like this, that, you know, prevents those kind of energetics from taking place, you know. Um, it's just good to discuss these issues because they are very real and they do matter. And, you know, the more we discuss these things openly and in a calm and civil manner and, you know, talk about these things like human beings, you know, the better off we are as a society, you know. Because we got to talk about these issues. I mean, they're not pleasant issues. They're not good issues. They're a nightmare to think about. But you know, it's it's a very real scenario. You know, it's it's not it's not something that you can just kind of <laughs> piss into the fan about, as it were. You got to kind of look at it as something substantial and go, hey, if this is left unchecked, you know. It could be very ugly. We can also take very small action that has very big effects when done on mass. Like one simple example, um, if every um, if every person in America that drives a car bought one less gallon of gasoline per week, do you think the oil companies would notice? <laughs> oh, I think they'd notice. <laughs> Most definitely. And I bet by and I and I bet by two gallons, if every American bought two gallons less, you know, it would just you'd start seeing companies having real trouble keeping up. Mm -hmm. You know, three gallons less, you'd have companies begging people to buy their oil. You know, I mean, it would just and not even just in America, but I mean if you know, not even just America, but like Canada and Europe, you know, and China, 
in Russia, if everybody collected, well, Russia's on its own oil, but, you know, the main, the main Western funded, you know, powers, if it were, as it were, if they just yeah. went three gallons less. If every, if every citizen in every one of these countries that was in that system, every citizen that drives, if they bought, you know, anywhere between one and three less gallons of gas per week, I think they'd they'd feel the hurt. <laughs> mm-hmm. and the desperation set in pretty quick, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's all kinds of things you can do, alternatives. I mean, it's just you know, and as people's awareness of situations rise and people start figuring things out and connecting the dots, I mean, that's how good things happen, you know. And that's how better worlds are made. You know, people see the problems put in front of them. They realize, hey, these are problems. We need to fix them. You know, in a solution that's the best for everybody. And you know, figure out as a society what to do next. You know, that's just that's just how a healthy society moves forward. You know, you got to kind of link arms, as it were, and you know, tackle these problems one by one. And just face them head on and with confidence and progress to each signpost slowly as a society and you know get there one by one, you know, all together, you know. Even having a small garden, um, if done on mass, would um, be a, a really good thing. I mean, if, let's say, you know, Half the people in the United States were spending a hundred dollars a year less on, you know, the grocery bill at the store because they were able to grow a little bit of their own food. Like not enough to make them completely, de- you know, independent, but at least enough to, you know, save a hundred dollars a year. You know, a hundred dollars a year times like, you know, what, a hundred and fifty million people or something. You oh, think even, that even more than grocery that. stores have noticed? Yeah, yeah. That's like a hundred and fifty million dollars that just disappeared overnight. Mm. Yeah. That's half of everything they sell just right there. Yeah, people started growing real victory gardens with non GMO seeds and we're making fresh tomatoes and fresh strawberries and, you know, blackberries and whatever else, you know, good edible foods that were wholesome and nutritious. People yeah. think they need to have like a huge garden in order to do it at all, but that's not true. You could have like two or two or three plant pots of whatever and a, a little fucking, you know, full spectrum uh, grow light in, you know, the freaking corner of your, your living room or something using like one of those energy saver bulbs and, you know, whatever. You don't, you don't have to go full hog wild on it. Even just doing a little bit, you know, just enough to knock like a hundred bucks off the bill. Um, and plus, the more healthier food that you're getting in you, you're not as hungry as much. I've noticed that myself. So you're spending on the regular food that you can't grow yourself, you know, that you still have to buy from the store. You start noticing that it actually lasts longer because the nutrition that's missing from that food you're now getting from another source so you're literally not as hungry as much and for anybody who wants to lose weight this is a good idea too mm-hmm. yeah no kidding yeah it's just it's just you know yeah there's all kinds of ways you can be self-sufficient you know figure out how to hook your house up to solar and you know wind power wherever possible, you know. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. And if you live out in the country, you know, you can have your um, well set up and have it hooked up to solar and, you know, have it electrically pumped to your house and all that stuff and, you know, have a nice fireplace and all the, the good amenities of being, you know, out in the country, you know, have your backdoor garden and all that stuff. My grandparents have got one of those. Real nice garden. You know, grow all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables and can and do all that stuff. I mean, you know. You don't even need to go hog wild on the electric. Like, 
if you could just through wind or solar or whatever provide just enough electricity for your heating and cooling and that's it then even if if your power were to go out and that's all you had well if you want to have light then you know use candles I mean you know electricity for the for you know everything else is is secondary the primary thing is being able to survive against the elements so heating and cooling mandatory mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends on your budget. You can do small things here and there, you know. I'm just saying, you know, if you're out in the country, which a lot of people around here are, you know, if you want to be what you would call self-sufficient, you know, you just have your solar panel setups and, you know, you can live off the grid. You know, that's one way to do it. Or you can be partially off the grid or, you know, just have heating and cooling and, you know, a few basic amenities, you know, and one way to do it, you know, so. So there's like a lot of small things that people can do that can really make a big difference and without all the stupidity happening there'd be no inspiration for conversations like this and for tossing ideas like this around. And sure. like another thing you could do is like um, if you go on like in places like Amazon.com and search a little like let's say you're someone who uses a lot of aluminum foil. If you buy aluminum foil at the store, you're going to spend a few bucks for this little bitty container of it that doesn't last long at all. But for like around thirty bucks you can get like a big ass industrial frickin roll of it that's like a thousand feet and you know thirty bucks of that should have last you at least several years which is a hell of a lot cheaper than you know spending like you know three four bucks a month or whatever on aluminum foil you know you're spending only a fraction of that and then um, paper plates and garbage bags are another thing I've noticed that you can buy in bulk. And I have bought in bulk on all the before mentioned. So, um, you know, I'm set for quite a while on these things. And, you know, even if up front, you know, you might have to pay 30 bucks for the aluminum foil. And you might have to pay something like, you know, 100 bucks for the garbage bags or, you know, 50 bucks for the paper plates or you know whatever it is you're only paying that much because you're buying up front in bulk but the amount of time that that's going to last you to where now you don't have that expense for a long time you know over the long haul that's going to save you a lot of money So there's a lot of small things people can do. And if done en masse, it does make a big difference. These corporations do notice. They look at that and they go, oh, shit. People are starting to wake up. They're not falling for our bullshit anymore. And they start freaking out a little. Uh -huh. Um, people don't realize that they could go into um, into thrift stores and on eBay and all sorts of places and get like um a used laptop for like a fraction of the price that a new one would cost and you know then you could like put Linux on it which is like a free operating system and most of the apps and stuff on there are free so it's like you know you're spending this minuscule amount of money instead of a whole shitload of money. And if more people started doing stuff like that, you know, I think the, um, I think Microsoft would notice. I think computer manufacturers would notice. I think the big boys had noticed, you know. Like, oh shit, people are getting smart. 
they're not just buying it because we put it on TV and say, you must have this, go do it now. Oh shit, they're waking up, they're thinking for themselves a bit more, what the fuck? Uh -huh. So there's a lot of real little things you could do that can have a really big impact over time. You don't have to have tons of money and start up your own little mini revolution or <laughs> whatever, you know. You can do very, very little bitty tiny simple grassroots things that really pack a powerful punch. Uh -huh. yeah, you can. And let it be known at Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy, we do not suggest you do psychopathic things and go out and hurt people when, you know, all of the crazy things that, you know, society would like to toss on, you know, little social experiments like this, you know. We're not, we're not a bunch of wackadoos, you know, a bunch of fringe nuts or whatever, you know, a bunch of conspiracy theorists, whack jobs, you know, we're just a couple of concerned citizens who just know what we know and, you know, we don't suggest doing violent things. All we suggest is, you know, taking small grassroots action and, you know, defending your sovereignty in peaceable ways, as the Founding Fathers would want you to do. Even the Founding Fathers didn't resort to, you know, the American Revolution until their back was against the wall. We don't suggest going out and starting fights and being antagonistic. You know, if that can be completely averted, you know, through other steps, that's great, but, you know, just remember the idea of a violent overthrow is a fire extinguisher. That was what it was originally purposed for, and that's what it should always be. It's just a fire extinguisher for when it gets so bad and the people in power get so unreasonable that there's just no other alternative because they've taken every way, taken every other alternative, you know, to do. If there like if Obama went like full blown Hitler or something, and people were starting to get thrown into camps and shit, then yeah, it's time to get out your gun. But that hasn't happened yet. Well, exactly, and I think that's primarily just due to the fact because of the rising energetics, you know. And I think they're starting to realize that everything they do backfires on them. What they try to do to put people to sleep backfires and turns into an awakening, you know, just a further accelerator in the awakening process, you know, and it's, we're going to win through information, we're not going to win through who's got more guns than who, who's more, got more nukes than who, who's got more what than who, you know, it's, it's an information war, you know, it's an info war, you know, and they're losing that war, they're losing the war over the minds of the American people and the people around the world, you know, people are awakening and people are realizing and people are going through their processes as a society, we're all going through it together. I notice that in small ways every day, everybody's connected in some way, we're all going through the same stuff on different levels of insanity, you know, and it's just one step at a time, you know, you just got to keep going forward, and keep moving forward, and keep moving forward, you know, you just got to keep your eye on the summit and just keep going, you know, there's no going back, you just got to keep going forward, you know. That's why I also think they're not going to shut down the internet, because that would cause so great of a reaction from the people that even the globalists wouldn't be able to control that chaos. Yeah, the internet, if they shut the internet down, that would just be, you know, that would just finalize the detonation to the nuclear weapon, essentially. Metaphorically be, speaking. Yeah, metaphorically speaking, it would just finalize the detonation, you know. I mean, the timer's already ticking down quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker, you know. It's going to go one way or another, you know, whether it goes violently or whether it goes in this like information like super clusterfuck of energetics that just totally evaporates their control mechanisms. I mean, you know, it, at some level it's going to be destructive to their control. It's going to completely wipe their control over us, you know. It's just a matter of time. It's just, you know, who knows how it's going to go. The future is of so many variables, you know. 
it would be a great pain in the ass trying to predict, you know, what's going to happen. You know, there's no way to predict. All we know is what we know in the now, and, you know, we can only base what we know in the now from what we've experienced in the past and kind of try to loosely configure things together like Lego bricks, you know, as to how it can go. But other than that, there's no real way to say this is the sure the surefire scenario, this is what's going to happen, this is, you know, even the, even just the slightest awareness of a potential possibility diverts that as being the possibility because you're already aware of it as being a possibility, you know, that's how quantum physics works, you know, and generally it's going to throw things at you that you don't expect and, you know, doors will open that aren't even considerable within your first frame of reference, you know, that's generally how quantum physics intervenes, is through the doors you don't see as open. And then, you know, you hear people like Drake and um, Benjamin Fulford and David Wilcox and all these other people talking about, you know, the events and mass arrests and this and that and so on and so forth and you know it's like you know they talk about it if it as if all that's matter of fact but really we got to look at it and that's just their opinion that's their that's just their perspective on it um, the way I see it you know if there were to be just sudden like mass arrests of the globalists and everything else that that sort of thing would really would really backfire. It's actually easier to take the long haul and just kind of nab them a few here, a few there, a few here, a few there. And that's kind of what we see happening. It's a gradual progression. A few people get nabbed here, a few people get nabbed there. Some other bankster asshole see that, commits suicide, <laughs> you know. It's not everybody being round up at once, but it's happening on a gradual progression. But people are impatient. They want it all now. Mm -hmm. Yep. People want to be, you know, the heroes of the revolution. People want to be the heroes of the rebellion, the uprising. They want to be the, the, the George Washington or the Vladimir Lenin or whatever, you know, political buzz figure word you want to put on it. It's just like, you know... We're all going to play a part in it somehow, you know. And no matter how big or how small, we all play a part, you know, just like the people in the American Revolution did, you know. And 2015 being the year of, the year of action and being, you know, synchronistically 240 years later, you know, kind of crazy if you really think about it. Um, I just reference back to the revolution as kind of a sense of comfort, you know, what we're going through right now is temporary, you know, it's, it's, it's going to pass, you know, everything that I've gone through, it'll pass, and, you know, it'll start anew all over again, you know, we're exiting one reality and entering a whole new one, everybody, and, and what I hear primarily, you know, from the Christian community, especially, and a lot of the doomsday community, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and go, we're in the end times, man. It's all over, you know. Pack your bags, man. We need to, uh, you know, have all this food and have all this shit, you know. I'm not saying don't prepare. I'm not saying don't be self-sufficient. I'm just saying the mindset is totally what the globalists are looking for. It's that MK Ultra mind fuck. Fear. You know, it's the fear porn, you know. The Russians are going to nuke us, man. The writing's on the wall, Putin's going to hit the button, he's crazy, blah, 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 blah. Ignoring the fact that uh, for the last four years it's been an entire false flag, you know, and then they're buying into the narrative again. You know, the Cold War <coughs> narrative. Mm -hmm. The Russians are going to totally clusterfuck us with nuclear weapons, which they're not, because what is mutually assured destruction? The globalists always wave the sword of ICBMs around as just kind of a, you know, like a magic wand, like, ooh, fear the ICBM, we're going to blow you up if you don't, you know, it's like, yeah, right, go ahead, wipe out the entire planet, kill off everything that you could possibly take control of, yes, that's totally logical, just wipe out the entire planet, kill everything on it, char the surface, bombard it with radiation, 
and fade irradiation, just totally cook it. You know, it'll take 10,000 years, 10,000 to a million years, depending on how long, how many weapons you launch, to totally do away with the naturally, you know, absorb the radiation. You're going to essentially turn the planet into Mars, lifeless, or the moon, lifeless. Is that what you want to do? I don't think so. You know, and, you know, the globalists wave that thing around like it's somehow legitimate, and you know humanity's waking up when... It would be are. like it would be like if Hitler stood up there with a gun to his own head and said, all right, Britain, surrender or I'll shoot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Britain would be like laughing at him like, oh, please do it. Uh-huh. Okay, Britain, surrender or I'll shoot. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just, it's just, it's ridiculous, you know? It's stupid. It's, and, and, you know, humanity's waking up when the crowd of people who believe that lie grow less and less and less and less. You know, when the, when the crowd of people, you know, screaming about it is something a serious issue turns smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, you just got a trickle of people who believe it, you know. And then eventually they, you know, awaken or, you know, energetically check out or whatever, you know. It's just, you know, yeah. as you said, as you said in another episode, another PSEC episode, you know, the Earth is going through giving birth right now and they don't have and the earth doesn't have the benefit of a epidural drip, you know. <laughs> that is really accurate that labor we kinda pain. are labor pains and we don't have the benefit of an epidural, you know. We don't, you know. It's a rough ride and you know, we're all of us are gonna get knocked around in some way and beaten over the head as it were with a metal baton. Yeah. Instead of taking three hours to give birth, it's taken going to take probably something like three decades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of us just get whacked around and beat up and whatever. I mean, you know, it's just kind of part of the part of the ride, if you will. You know, but you just keep going. You just keep doing what you're doing. You just stay calm and cool. Inter the universe is going to throw curved balls one way or another, you know. Whether it's getting whacked over the head or, you know. For people, that are, for people that are worried about dying, here's one simple thing to where they could, they could alleviate their fears really, really quickly. It's a two-point deal. Point one, if you're dead, the dead have no need to worry. So the idea of worrying is negated right off the bat. Number two, if you're not dead, then it's pointless to worry. Because if you're alive, you can do things in your life. And if you're dead, then you don't have to worry about what to do or not do. So either way, if you're dead, there, there's, it will literally negates worry. And if you're alive, then you're not dead, which again negates worry. So... All worry does is just set you up for self-sabotage. That's all it fucking does. So you can sit there, worry, 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 worry until you die, or you can just say, well, forget this fucking worrying thing, because that's stupid. That's like, you know, getting plastered on alcohol and going out fucking driving. Why do that? You know? So either way, worrying is stupid. I'm not saying people shouldn't be mad at the globalists. I'm not saying... You know, that, that 15 second fear reaction that gets you out of the way of the oncoming truck to avoid you being roadkill is bad or anything. I'm just saying that perpetually immersing yourself into ever increasing worrying and fear doesn't do anything for you except make things worse. So if you're really fearing the worst case scenario, you're doing it to yourself. And if you don't want the worst case scenario, simple, stop doing it to yourself. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. It's it just yeah. We live in crazy times, you know. It's energetics that are off the walls and off the charts, you know, it's like a roller coaster. 
you know, up, down, left, right, loop to loop, you know, do a corkscrew, you know, all of that stuff. You know, it's like being put in a, it's like being strapped to the front of a supersonic aircraft and launched into the stratosphere and sitting there having your jaw halfway, you know, over your skull and, you know, wind and all that stuff. I mean, it's just like, Whoa. We can worry our, yeah. we can worry ourselves until we have so much stress hormone running running through our veins that our body is turned into nothing more than a biological petri dish for growing different types of cancer. Or <laughs> we can maybe not fuck ourselves over like that and maybe stop worrying all the time. Uh -huh. Exactly. They won't tell you that the cause of most illnesses is stress. Period. Everything else isn't a cause; it's just an aggravating factor. Obviously, if your body is in a stressful, weakened state, and then you eat or drink or do things to weaken it even more, it will weaken even more. But that doesn't mean that those things won't cause it. The primary cause is stress. What is that in the background? Uh, whatever that is, could it be turned off? Because I don't want to risk any RIAA, DMCA fucking bullshit getting into the stream here. Oh, it's just one little tiny split. That's all. It's it does. Okay, well, they don't really care. I mean... I've had an entire, you know, video freaking third party match because of five seconds of audio. Hopefully it was garbled enough that it doesn't match. But yeah, the YouTube people are Nazi assholes, so never underestimate the strike. Yeah, just as Bob Marley said, don't worry, be happy. Because you were talking about, you know, people who worry and then, you know, Pop Marley's Don't Worry, Be Happy popped into my head and it's like, oh, well, yeah, that's synchronistically aligns. Well, hell, be extremely sad if you want to. You can still not worry while you're being sad. <laughs> true, true. But the healthy thing to do is to not worry and to be happy. <laughs> you can't live life you gloom all the time. If you're gloomy, you miss out. Or if you're sad, let yourself be sad. So then you can be happy. Because if you're sad about being sad about being sad about being sad, it creates a negative feedback loop, and then you won't ever be happy. And all you'll do is worry. <laughs> The landlord say your rent is late. You may have to lint the gate. Don't worry. Be happy. You can't change what you don't own. And if you don't own how you feel, <laughs> then you can't change how you feel. Yeah, I just I just love it, you know. You be genuine in expression and people get all, you know, hurt by it and they're like, You can't feel that way because I I'm hurt about it. And da, 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 da. How dare you feel that way? That's wrong and selfish and you know, it's like, okay, so for me for anybody, you know, anybody in any circumstance, it's like so for anybody to feel genuine about something like they don't like someone or they don't want to be around someone or they think a situation is fucked or whatever. You know, it's really immature when people, but of course, again, given their paradigms, you know, they're self-absorbed. 
you know, because they're too busy feeling sorry for themselves already, you know. It's like, you know, you can't, you can't bash people when they're feeling genuine on their expression. You just got to kind of let them feel how they're going to feel and just, you know, accept how they feel. Let them feel how they want to feel and accept that as their reality and their right to it, you know. That doesn't mean you have to like it. Doesn't mean you have to like it. It doesn't, mean, it, it doesn't mean you have to be approving or anything of that nature, you know. No. You can dislike it and have your opinion on it. But, you know, you just accept it for what it is. That's their choice. And, you know, you just let them do what they're doing. And, you know. And that doesn't mean that you can't tell them that you don't like what they're doing. That mm -hmm. just don't treat them like a like a fucking nasty, dirty criminal that's lower than scum. Yeah, exactly. The only and I've noticed this even with the recent events I've gone through. You know, it's the ego that screams for you to treat them like scum or like you know a dog. You know, and I've gone through a lot of shifting, like where I'd go to sleep and my mind would just go on this like you know marathon, like, two-hour-long rage spree, you know, like, where this film would start rolling in the head, and, you know, it just, like, all this, you'd feel like this rage just venting out of your body like a freaking radiator port. It's like, oh, man, that's some dark energy. <laughs> Trying to go to sleep, and, you know, you can literally see your subconscious in real time, you know, all this crazy stuff going on in there, and it's like, ooh. Good thing I'm getting rid of it during my sleep cycle, you know, let it just vent out into space. Kind of like deadly theta radiation, you know. <laughs> just kind of like the body turning on the valves and going, okay, time to let off the steam, you know, cool off the reactor a little bit, you know. <clears throat> vent out the ports. And that's healthy for the body to do. I mean, if you can find healthy ways to just let it out subconsciously and just let it out into space and just leave it there and just let it go, you know, all the better. And, you know, you don't need any Monsanto mind-altering medications to do that. You know, you just got to have strong sense of will and just know that, you know, Chemical denial. That's what I call medications that are used to cover up emotions. It's chemical denial. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's total the chemical problem denial. Is gone. It's still doing harm to you biologically, neurologically, emotionally, and psychologically. The medication just helps you ignore it. It's like ignoring the fact that you keep fucking carving up your leg with a hacksaw. It's not that yeah. they stop you from cutting your damn, cutting into your leg and chopping it into pieces. The meds are just letting you ignore the fact that you're destroying yourself. Uh, well, yeah, those Monsanto meds just do nothing but you know put a bandage on the inevitable. You know, it's like you got a freaking you know, it's like one of your arteries is split open and spurting blood, and then Monsanto slaps a band-aid with a nice little yellow smiley face on it, saying, there, you're all better. You know, it's like, no, I'm not. And they're like, shut up, yes you are, you're all better. Because As that the band-aid band -aid is quickly better. turning red, getting saturated with blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, I mean, it's the same kind of logic, and it's just like, keep your, focus. keep your focus on the yellow smiley face, don't look at the red. See, when you paradigm shift in the proper way, it's like taking that leg into the surgeon. The surgeon goes, oh my, we have a problem. Let's solve this in a logical but fun way. Guess what? Leg is healed. You're fine. Everything's fine. You let out what you needed to let out. You fixed your leg. Life is good again. You have a new friend. And you're, you're recovering. Yes. In, you're and recovering. You're, in and you're recovering. Tripping yeah. on better stuff than they smoked in Vietnam, and you know. Yeah, ex <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you got two pretty nurses next to you. You know, you're surrounded by new friends, and you know, life is going well, and you're you're finally waking up to what life is, what life is all about, how beautiful it is, how vibrant it is, and how 
amazing it is and what an adventure it is, you know, even through the high points and the low points, you're, you're seeing the patterns, what you've always known about life, and it's like, wow, it is majestic, you know, and it's a privilege to be here. You know, Here's your healthy. nurses, Hillary and Janet Reno. <laughs> <laughs> Too much drugs, lower the level, lower the level. <laughs> I'm taking the night night stuff. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he's up like a candle. He'll wake up in a few hours. <laughs> and he'll wake up to Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> With like a fucking like you know Freddy Krueger sharp knife glove hand thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Spock on the other side checking on your you know checking on your vitals, and he looks over at Pelosi and goes, "Fascinating." And then walks up to her and puts the Vulcan nerve pinch on her neck, and she goes limp and just falls back into the chair, sound asleep. You look at Spock and go, Mr. Nimoy, aren't you dead? And he goes, so what's your point? <laughs> <laughs> I've been here before. What, what, what else is new? I've been here before. This is the second time now. Yeah, Leonard Nimoy just, like, digs himself out of his grave, and he's, like, a teenager running around going, I'm Leonard Nimoy! Who is this crazy kid? <laughs> I, I'm Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> they use the Genesis device on me. <laughs> okay, let's take him to the state hospital. No, I'm Leonard Nimoy, does the Vulcan pinch, and <laughs> the guy just drops on the ground, like, paralyzed, and he's sitting there going, I think he's Vul, I think he's Vulcan. <laughs> yeah, see my ears? Oh, well, by the way, Scotty and the Doc say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Into the other side. Yeah, of James Doohan and DeForest Kelly. Yep. But yeah, that's, you know, life is life and life is wonderful, you know. And that's how I genuinely feel. You know, sure, you know, things aren't, there are, you know, Stuff's been happening to me that's not a good situation. Things have been less than stellar, but, you know, in terms of, you know, anything, it's a day, you know, an hour, a minute, you know, it's not, it's not anything that's huge. It's not the end of the world. I'll continue on and I'll continue doing my thing, continue doing my thing, you know, it's just... You know, and that goes for everybody. You know, people got to realize. No evolution without growth. No growth without challenge. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and people got to realize that. You know, it's like the only way to get strong is to, you know, be strong to go through. You know, sometimes life is going to throw some curveballs at you. You just got to know how to take the blows and deal out, you know, life gives you lemons, you gotta make lemonade. Life gives you oranges, you make orange juice. If life gives you apples, you make apple juice. If, you know, life gives you cranberries, you make cranberry juice. I mean, you know, the list goes on. Yeah, there's part of me that sometimes says that, you know, with all I know and with what I've been doing that, you know, I by now I should be making, you know, tons of money with YouTube and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But then logic sets in and says, you know, that's as stupid as opening up a storefront and, like, you know, pissing and moaning that, like, you know, a week later you're not rolling in the money. You know, it's just like, 
you know, all things worth doing takes time, and except for those lucky synchronistic few, it's not just going to like downpour millions of dollars or whatever, just for no apparent reason. But if you keep persevering with what you're doing, eventually the money you're looking to make will come in the time that it comes. But if you're impatient and looking for self-gratification, expecting to plant a tree seed today and a 40-foot tree to come tomorrow, you'll constantly sabotage yourself and be like, no, no, this isn't worth doing, I can't do it, blah, 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 and so on. So It's all about the journey. But people who won't continue making the steps forward, they don't. And so they will perpetually fail, being none the wiser that it's because they cho chose to stop moving forward. Uh -huh. So this episode being about signposts, when you see good happening around you but not directly to you know that it's a signpost that good things half a mile next right but not if you pull your car over and stop the engine and say fuck it I'm not going on <laughs> or it's like that really good photo you shared on uh, the PSEC Facebook page you know where the guys going for the diamonds down below, and he's walking away, you know, giving up, going, screw this, and he's just, like, only an inch away from the diamonds, and the other guy, you know, who's following his heart is just, you know, going, you know, just one whack after another, after another, after another, and he's just going, and he's 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 going. you know, he's determined. Mm -hmm. And he's going to get there, because he's determined. I always like to say that things happen slower than we'd like, but quicker than we think. Mm -hmm. It kind of puts it at the middle, because people like to think in absolute extremes. It's either one way or it's the other, totally to the right or totally to the left. And usually it's neither. Usually it's somewhere in the middle. I mean, hell, even science says that most things fall within that bell-shaped curve, so to speak. Things things tend to happen in the curve, in that in that middle part, not at one end of the extreme or the other. And I mean, it's, you know, it's okay to have really, you know, high hopes and high goals and really lavish goals and whatever is, as long as those aren't expectations and as long as you're not impatient. Because people who have high goals and high expectations and high levels of impatience usually don't get where they're going. And they spend their whole life in regret and disappointment. They miss all the times that opportunity knocks. They don't see it for what it is. They see it as just some annoying buzzing thing that they do their best to ignore. They don't know what it is, but they're running like hell away from it because it's it sounds different than what they're used to, and it's it's annoying them, and they just run. And I know in recent times, something that's kind of pleasantly challenged your paradigms a bit is, um, I know there's an old female friend you just started talking to recently, and it, at first when she said she's too busy to hang out and whatever, you were like, oh man, and I was, you know, present for the conversation with you, and I'm like, oh, come on, dude. She she didn't say absolutely forever. Or she's just talking about right now. Ask her when she's free. So then you did, and she's like, well, in two weeks it'd be cool. 
and then you know she mentions that she likes the movie Short Circuit, and you know you've never seen Short Circuit one or two, but you've heard of it because I told you about it and you know showed you the trailers and stuff. Well, no, 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 no. Don't confuse people. I wasn't going. Oh, come on, fuck this. I was just going. Yeah, I was being totally cool about it the whole time. I was just telling you about it. I didn't say you weren't being cool. I was just saying your first initial impulse is kind of like, eh, quick impulse. I'm not saying you were droning on like an emo depressive. I'm saying it was your... I wasn't droning on at all. I was just... You know, I'm not saying you were. I'm saying quite the opposite. I'm not saying you were. I'm just saying you had kind of a split-second reaction. That's all it was. I'm not saying it was anything more than that. That saying you were going on like some email. careful, careful with your language. You gotta let people know what you mean. And I did. Doesn't help if someone's not listening, though. I can't force any in my will over someone else's. If they're not listening, they're not listening. But anyway, and so then synchronistically, she didn't even know that there was a short circuit part two, and then you informed her of that. Mm -hmm. So now one of these days in the near future. You'll get to see both of them for the first time, and um, she'll get to see the second one for the first time. She didn't even know that existed, so. Uh -huh. Point uh -huh. is, it was a good reflection. Mm -hmm. And by synchronicity, an airplane is flying over. Planes are always flying over you. They like you. Yeah, thank you. I must think you're all right, too. Well, I live in Chicago. There's fucking planes everywhere. Mm-hmm. Living in a city that happens to contain O'Hare Airport has that effect. Mm -hmm. Not to mention we've also got Midway Airport as well, so we've got two airports. So, city of heavy air traffic, most definitely. We used to have a third airport, but um, it got um, condemned in order to create Millennium Park. I do believe that airport was called Miggs Field. Miggs Field, that's an interesting one. And it was, it was primarily for smaller private air traffic. So that um, smaller private planes had some place to go that wasn't interfering with uh, larger traffic. Uh -huh. But now the smaller private planes have to deal with the bigger airports like everybody else does. Because their landing strip is no more. But anyway, I guess the overall points about signposts is just, um, you know, to just be aware that, you know, when life throws you a signpost, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We're just taught to misinterpret it and misread it because it's outside of our paradigm. And it might be wise to stop and think for a second and really ask whether or not that signpost is really actually trying to show us something altogether completely different than what we're thinking. Now for me, that whole thing with Nixie just like sparked my imagination to all sorts of ideas, and we were talking about that the other night. So it actually sparked up some ideas for how to, you know, improve the channel and, you know, add on to, to PSEC and, you know, expand into 
a whole bunch of other different, you know, cool realms with it and stuff. And, you know, you and I were talking about the possibilities of that. And maybe I'll go over those in another PSEC episode. I'm going to tired right now, and it's like 3 a.m. here. But, um, you know, I saw that, and I ignored Ego's little buttheartedness about it and just moved into imagination mode and like, hmm, you know, how could I take this inspiration and, um, you know, use it to <clears throat> make what I'm doing better? And a whole ton of ideas had flooded in. Now, of course, if I aligned with Ego and just got all butthurt and been like, man, everybody else always succeeds but me, then I wouldn't have activated my imagination. Ideas wouldn't have come flooding in, and I wouldn't be able to take action on those. Uh -huh. I'll talk about those in another Hangout. Still uh -huh. hammering out some of the details, but came up with some pretty cool shit, so I'll be tossing those out there in the near future and seeing what people think. So yes, thank you, Nixie Pixel, for that. Well, have we said all there is to say on this topic, or is there anything more you would like to add? No. Well, I've said everything that I can think of saying. You and me both. So, uh, thanks everybody for uh, watching, listening, whatever. I know we had some people viewing live, but uh, not anymore at the moment. Then again, it is the middle of the night. So thanks for listening, and catch you all later. Have a good night or morning or whatever the hell it is where you are. Yep. Signing off.